In other words, they're defined in terms of how things behave. So A is a type if when you run it, it has a value, and that value is the index of a membership relation. And we say that M is a member of A if you determine the membership relation, if you take the membership relation that's determined by A, and you decide that the, whether or not you state whether or not M inhabits, uh, satisfies that specification. That when you evaluate M, I uh, give you back a value that is indeed a value of the type that's determined by A. Then we said, well, if we're going to have dependent types, we're going to have families of types that depend on values, then we have to worry about, at least that's one way in, is to say, well, at the very least, uh, if I do that, I have to worry about when elements are equal, and equal equality of elements determine equality of types. So really, the whole story is, I have to define when are two types equal, and when are two elements of the type equal. That's the idea. And then we recover, those are going to be defined to be symmetric and transitive relations. And the jargon for that is a partial equivalence relation. The partial part meaning not necessarily reflexive. However, because it's symmetric and transitive, if, for example, A is equal to A prime, then it's symmetric, it will, will work out to be symmetric. So A prime is equal to A by symmetry. So by transitivity, A is equal to A. So it's reflexive on its field. That is, in the, if anything participates in the relation, it's related to itself. But it's not necessarily the case that anything is related. Related. So that's the point. Okay, so that's called the uh, partial equivalence relation. It's just the terminology. Okay, so they'll be symmetric and transitive and respect uh, type equality. The whole point of type equality is to say if A and A prime are deemed to be equal as types, it means that they name the same member equality relation. That's all. That's, that's the idea. Uh, and naming it means if you run both sides, you're going to get values. Those, value, those type values are going to index the same notion of membership. So that's the, the idea there. And then I got a little bogged down yesterday, and now I'm going to deliberately wave my hands a little more. I'm going to just assert the existence of certain type systems, and I will make some indications about why they exist, but the whole story of like how that works would take me quite a lot of time. I realized yesterday I got, felt a little uh, cherry. So I'm just going to assert the existence of certain things. You can look in papers that I've cited you, and I handed out unfortunately very, very incomplete notes that I had been writing that I didn't get far as far along done with as I had hoped to by the time I got to the summer school, but you can at least, it gives the lay of the land and starts to do some development. You might be able to pick up some feeling from there, I hope. Okay, but anyway, there are the other backing sources that I've mentioned to you, okay? Just the triple equals, is that, is the triple equal sign the same as the yeah, why did I do? Why did I do that? I have no idea why I did that. Okay, that's equal thought is what I meant. I, don't, I have no idea what, I, what I'm doing there. <laughs> I don't know. I was complaining about Trump and now I'm deranged. Okay, <laughs> so I, I don't know why I have no, thank you for saying that, that's completely insane. I have no idea what I did there because it's not what I ever write. I mean, if you look in the papers, you'll see. Okay, so sorry about that. Those are the notion of exact equality. Well, that's completely nuts. I don't know what I was doing. Well, I kind of do. You'll see in a minute why I was thinking ahead. I think by the end of this lecture, I'll be able to say something about that. That would sort of explain my craziness. Okay, good. Those are meant to be exact equations. They were not meant to be some new notation that you didn't see yesterday. So, okay, sorry about that. Uh, I have no explanation. Okay, so, uh, good. So, so that's the sort of basic setup uh, of what constitutes a type system. And the main thing is that they're defined by computation. So I explained it in terms of canonical membership. The things are, so these, there's an issue of, we, we define, they're all defined in terms of evaluation and other things, in terms of evaluation, because they're all about behavior of programs. Even the types are programs that behave a certain way. So it's defined in terms of evaluation using, I don't know what to say here, certain constructions that you're supposed to accept. And there, it is possible, I'm sorry for that vague uh, vagueness, but that's the thing I can't, uh, I don't have time to explain. There are sources that explain what you're supposed to understand there, but I'm, I'm hoping that most of these things are fairly clear. Okay, so that's my, that's my idea. So you have to, yeah, you have to, yep. So in the top right there, 
So is that saying what for all A? So it's yeah, so A type means A is equal to A, and M is in A means M equals M in A. So my idea was, at first you just say I wanted to find type put in membership, but then you quickly realize you have to talk about equal types and equal members. They e behave equally as elements of a type. And then you derive the original things from them as a special case. That's a stan standard move with partial equivalence relations. That's what you do. So the if and only if goes with any type. Yeah, by definition. In other words, this is, I didn't know what the, I was trying to squeeze here. So this is sort of by definition. OK. It's going to be that the case. I'm just saying if you know your first thought is you just want to have type of membership, and then you realize I must deal with equality also. So that's the idea. Okay, so that's the way these things are. That's the way these things are set up. And then we talked about the so-called hypothetical, hypothetical, general, general, whatever word we want to use. The main point is to express functionality. That whenever you have a free variable, what you, this, that's the indication here. So type is a as a, as a type parameterized by a with, with the variable little a, then what it means is it has a functional dependency. That is, it's a family of types that every member of a will give you a type. That's certainly true. But moreover, equal members of a give you equal types. Now, so in particular, if you take what I have in the upper right, you could write this m is equal to m, just pick m prime to be the same thing. In other words, you're saying if m is in a, then b of m is a type because it'll be b of m equals b of m. So it covers that as a special case. So, but it means it re, re, re it equality. And the same for a family of elements or a mapping. And I may or may not have emphasized last time that when I write this, because of the setting that I'm in, n can involve a and so can b involve a. So the idea then is that for the elements, I want to say, give me any two equal elements. So it's going to be a functional dependency. It's a mapping. OK, then I want n to respect that equality. And, it, and where will that equation take place? Well, in b of m. You could write b of m here. And then you can say, yeah, well, why did you write b of m? Well, because it doesn't matter. Because I'm going to write this, and that's the notion of a presupposition. So right here, we have the notion of a presupposition. So I'll write presupposing, I only write this when I sort of already know B is a type dependent on A. In other words, I, I only consider the idea of a mapping from A to B where B depends on A. If a priori A is a type, so we also have A is a type. So a priori A is a type and B is a family of type indexed by A, then I can speak about what it means to be a mapping. And when I do that, I will be speaking about instances of B. I'll be talking about elements of A and instances of B. And because B is a mapping that depends on A, that's my presupposition, then this type is equal to that type. So it classifies the same elements. So at which type I stipulate the equation is irrelevant because they're the same. So in some sense, I'm showing you how all the machinery, it all fits together like a very well-oiled machine. Uh, that's what's kind of a nice thing is somehow everything is there for a reason and nothing is there that isn't needed. It's very, very kind of slick. Okay, so I'm hoping to at least convey a sense of that. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the general setup. And then I wrote these out for what it means to be a family of types and what it means to be an element, a family of elements or a mapping. But really, I have to say, what does it mean to be equal families and what does it mean to be equal elements? So I would write similar definitions here. And it means everything in sight respects equality. Let's just define it that way. It's the easiest thing there are technical devices you can use, but let's just say they, they're all the same. So in other words, if I claim that B and, and B prime are equal families indexed by A, I mean that both sides should be, should be families of types indexed by A. And moreover, item by item, if you give me equal indices, then these will be equal. So it'll be sort of horizontally equal and vertically equal. You might depict it like that. Okay, so, so that's, the, uh, that's the kind of setup. So we, we're, we're going to use this kind of a setup. And then what we talked about, and I got a little bogged down because I was trying to use the Booleans as an on-ramp to other things, but we can, we can try to do this uh, very thing. So I will claim there exists a type system. I, I guess it's better like this. And for this word, I, I, I might have used a computational type system. I might have said a semantic type system. I don't know. OK. Uh, or I, I just wanted to emphasize, as I did last time, these things are not recursively enumerable. They're not given by rules. No, no, that's not what I'm doing. OK. And, uh, and in fact, what 
what I'm doing is I'm starting with the semantics in terms of computation because that's what I like, okay? There's discussion on Slack about all sorts of other reasons. Let's leave those aside. I just like this, okay? So I'm, I'm doing it, okay? I don't need to take philosophical positions to present the technical development. So let, let me just stick with that, okay? And, and you might like to know, and you can look on Slack uh, about discussion of these things. But anyway, we'll do this. Uh, containing Booleans, okay? And what do I mean by that, the Booleans? Well, what do I mean? I'm quickly reviewing here. So what I'm going to say is uh, bool is equal to bool. Or, in other words, that's just a way of saying bool is a type. And really, this is a canonical type. I can write it like a zero here. So I'll just gloss over that issue of exactly how we construct these things, and I'll kind of express what the outcome is. So bool will be a type. Okay, so there exists a type system. We can discuss separately in another venue how we prove that. But let's say it exists a type system in which we have a, a type expression called Boolean. It's a program. It's called Boolean. And then we can just say m is equal to m prime in bool. It will turn out if and only if either, oh, wait for it, you'll be shocked, m evaluates the true. I wrote, yesterday I wrote my, some, FTTNFF for some reason. Okay, so either M evaluates to true or M evaluates to false. Okay, done. Now, it's true, I was talking about the least thing, and the reason is I wanted to use it as an on ramp for other things. But here I don't have to worry about least or greatest, it doesn't make any difference. So I just want to say that's, oh, oh I'm sorry, M evaluates to true and I was doing members, and prime evaluates to true or, whoops, this and M prime evaluates to false. That's the equality. For the members, uh, the reflexive case is just uh, true or false. Okay, good. So that's simply the definition. And then what I was pointing out to you, and I'll do something a little more general this time. So the fact is, all right, that if you have a, fa a Boolean index family of types, let's just write it like that. So B is depending on a Boolean, so it could be a conditional. Okay. If we have that, uh, and we have, I think I called them something like M1 is in B, I'm, change, I'm doing a more general version this time, B with true for A, I called it A, right? Yep, B with true for A, and M2 is in B with false for A, then, uh, uh, oh, and one more thing, I can write it like this, and M is itself a bool, okay, then a program called if, which M1, M2 of M is going to itself be equal to, uh, excuse me, is going to be in B with M for A. And moreover, I'll write some other things in a minute, okay, but the first thing is that. Now, what I'm assuming here is you already know how to evaluate a conditional. So really over on the side here, I will remark as I did last time that this makes a transition. It, so to say, evaluates its argument. Okay, that's true when M steps to M prime. And then the expected thing is it does a branch on true and it becomes M1 and it does a branch on false and it becomes M2. So this is hardly surprising, okay. So these are, these are uh, binary decision diagrams, essentially, is what I'm doing, except that I don't require that they, they compute only Booleans. Okay, so the idea here is that, so that's the setup. I hope I, I hope I said it right. I like to sort of halfway invent it with you rather than look at my notes because I hope it makes it a little more dynamic, but I'm going to make more mistakes, so forgive me for that. Okay, so the main point here is that you'll notice that I will just write here CF program analysis, okay? Because the idea is, if, you, if that means something to you, good, and if not, never mind, okay? The point is, is that the then clause and the else clause of the conditional know which branch they're in. It knows that, that the, the, the conditional has come out true. See, the conditional is going to be B of M. M, M is, is going to itself be dependent on M, on this capital B is going to be dependent on capital M. The then case knows that M is true, and the, and the else case knows that M is false. So I propagate this information. That's how it will turn out that 
when I have an if here that I gave you last time, this itself can be an if and it can branch on, on, on that Boolean and then decide on the type depending on how the Boolean comes out. So it knows which way it is. And that's typically in sort of PLDI world taken to be some characteristic of program analysis, but in a sufficiently rich type systems, this is all rolled in. Okay, so you should maybe might find that. It's just a side remark. Okay, so good, so we can do this. And my point is, is that it's a fact. In other words, this is like a thing you prove, okay, that you prove, okay. Uh, it's not defined, like I don't say, oh, by definition, something like that. No, it's a, it's a fact. Because remember, this statement says something about program behavior, okay. So what do we know? We know that either M evaluates the true or M evaluates the false. That we know. Why do we know that? Because we have this assumption here. And we have uh, this definition, okay? So that's what we're doing. So I'm proving that, I'm saying fix B, fix M1, fix M2, and then I'm proving that if M is in bool, then something. That's where the induction principle comes in. And the induction principle is M is either true or false, though. Okay, so we know it's gonna evaluate either true or false, okay? So that's what we wanna do. And so all I need, I just need, uh, I need sort of two ideas that we have to be careful about. So notice, I'll say, therefore, M is actually exactly equal to true in this case, in bool, and then we have or, and on the other case, M is exactly equal to false. Well, why do we know that? Well, it's not, again, by definite, well, it is, it follows from the definitions, and the reason is, is by head expansion, or reverse execution. Because true is equal to true in bool by definition somewhere, okay, because it, they both evaluate the true, so true is equal to true. But M steps to true, so I can reverse the execution, so M is equal to true. That's what's saying here, and the same thing is happening there. So that, that's how that thing, so this is by head expansion. So we'll often need uh, a little move like that. It's not as though exact equality is literally defined, you know, so that it's, it's a sort of a little fact, okay, a very little fact, so we have to say that. Okay, good, so we do that. Okay, and now, uh, good, that's what I want to say here. And really, yeah, okay, that's what I want to say here. And then, uh, let's see, what is it that I want to do? Oh, right, so we know that M, if you look at M1, we know that M1 is in B, well, let's do case one and case two will be the same. So we know that M1 is in B with true for A. That's an assumption that we're given. Okay, and now if you look, if you take so, and then we can figure that the following thing is the case. We do, if M1, M2, M, okay, that is going to be the same as if M1, M2, true, because M is equal to true, and that is going to be the same as M1. And why is that? It's again a head expansion, because the if on the true steps to M1, so it's equal to M1, okay? and we would be able to, it, and then I also want to argue that because the if evaluates its argument in this position only, that whatever M is is gonna be the same as what true is because that's the way the evaluation works. So these are both really true by head expansion. And we know that this is in B with true for A because that's what we were given. However, because we know that M is equal to true and B is a family, it's given that B is a family right up there where I said fact, then that's, of course, respects equality, so that's in B with M for A. And then we're done in that case. So what we get is, is that in the true case, we get this uh, is in B with M for A, when M is equal to true. We also get the same looking thing, but with false mediating here and M2 and false. So we get another line. So now I get the same outcome in either case, so, it's, so therefore the, the fact is a fact. Okay, so I wanted you to see the machinery, okay? So the important point was that B is a family of types, so it respects equality. Equality judgments are defined in terms of evaluation, so they're closed under head expansion. Then I use both of those facts in order to reason that, well, the thing in question, this simplifies to this, so they're equal, and because it, it, they're equal, and then it makes this dispatch, and because that's assumed to be here, but well, that's the same as that, I get the endpoints that I want, which is that, in either case, this if is in that, in that type, regardless of whether M is equal to true or false. And by definition, I know that's all I have to do, so I'm done.
Okay, so that's a very simple thing. All right, so now I can prove lots of other things. And I, well, so exercises you can work out. And I spoke, for example, about the Shannon expansion. So under similar assumptions, you can prove that M1, M2 of true, well, I already really used this fact, so let's leave this alone. The important one is the following. Under similar assumptions, so I want to say, uh, so I have, well, let me say them. So I have this equation, which you can verify easily. That's exactly equal to M1 in B with true, which is B with M1, uh, B with true for A. So you can check that under the same assumptions, uh, the conditional with false is equal to M2 in B with false for A. So you can check that for yourself. These are all things you should check. So that's like one, two, okay. Now three, here's a particular thing you can prove that might be of, of interest, which is this one. Uh, I can do this uh, generically. Uh, I can do this generically in A, or I can say this. Under these assumptions, is exactly equal to, uh, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. What I meant to do was this. I want to say M is equal to if true, false, M. Uh, yes, in bool. So in other words, if I have a Boolean, I can take it apart and put it back together, and that will be the same thing as what I got. So this is a kind of a expressing a universal property. That's one of the things that's going on here. In fact, more generally, what we have is if I, oops, if I have, uh, this is the Shannon expansion I mentioned before. So if I, oops, this should say bool. Okay, and I have P is in B. Okay, so we have family of elements here where I'm assuming that this is a, a family of types. Okay, then we can prove in general that P with M for A is the same as uh, a split in which I put here P with true for A and P with false for A on M. Uh, where, you know, under, I have all the same assumptions going on, so, okay, going on that I, that I wrote up here, okay, and so the idea is that, and this is called the Shannon expansion. So this comes up a lot if you've ever studied BDDs, okay, binary decision diagrams. It basically says, I like to say it, you pivot on M. You have, you have a term here and it's got a Boolean in it somewhere. So what you do is you pivot on M. You say, okay, let's, let's branch on the fact whether M is true or false and propagate that information into each branch, okay? And then you, the BDDs are created by choosing the pivots in a way that minimizes the size of the, of the conditional that you do. And the fact is you can't do better than exponential in the worst case, but it, you can do better in practice, okay? And so the whole, the whole business of doing BDDs and reasoning using BDDs is sort of based on that. Okay, so this is the, the Shannon expansion, that's how it goes. So you can prove things like that. So you can leave those as an exercise. So the point is, is that these are all, uh, these are all, uh, yeah, so these are all things that you can prove. So you should make sure you know how to do them. The reasoning goes very similar to this. And now I'm going to move on if you don't mind me being brisk. Okay, is that okay? Okay, good. So that's the kind of setup. So the, if, if you want to know, uh, when I start writing out, if you see the facts that I wrote out, they look a, an awful lot like the things that are, that are given by definition in a formal type system. And that's true. And the reason is I'm choosing these facts in order to express that, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to end up saying the following thing. The semantic is going to define what is true. The formalisms are going to give a pale approximation to the truth. They're just things that you can formally derive because that's useful for implementation. And everything that they can derive ought to be true. And I'm proving the little, the little lemmas you need in order to verify that. That's the method of logical relations because what I'm doing is I'm I'm having type indexed information that when I say M equals M prime in A, I'm saying for every type, I have an index and the type determines what equality means. When I talk in next lecture about, in more detail about the meaning of equality, you'll see that formal type theory is in a big hole. And I'm gonna have to, I'll try to show you how that, 
how that works out. And it has to do with uh, a discrepancy between the semantics and the syntax that's pretty hard to resolve. Okay, so I'll get to that. Uh, there's some technical machinery involved in doing that, so I'll, I'll get to that. Okay, so that's where we are. All right, so good. So that's the, the kind of setup. So now what I want to do is briskly go through some other things, okay? So, and now comes the, the reason I went through that business about the strongest, because now I care. So I'm, I'm also going to say as an example, uh, there exists a type system, if you don't mind me being brief, containing the natural numbers. Okay, that will not surprise you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a type symbol and I'm going to have it be a type, so I'll call it that. So that's a program and it, it's going to be, it's going to index a, a type equality relation. And I'm going to say, now here's where the difficulty comes in or where I have to be careful. So I want to say, as I uh, was doing last time with the Booleans, I want to say this, I want to say it's the strongest thing or, or, or smallest or various extreme words like that, such that uh, uh, the following conditions are satisfied. Either m evaluates to zero, m prime evaluates to zero, in which there's nothing else to say, or m evaluates to the successor of some n, and m prime evaluates to the successor of n prime, and with n itself again being equal in that. Okay, that's what, I, that's what I care about. That's just what you thought I would write. The only thing I want to be a little careful about, which you have to watch, is the elements of NAT are not, in the ordinary sense of the word, just the natural numbers, in other words, just the numerals, because the successors are computations. These are things that, e oh, this should have said n prime. These are computations that will, again, satisfy the same requirement. But they get to run, okay? This gets to run. Because the definition is, well, either they both evaluate to zero or they both evaluate to another successor. And I want it to be as small as possible. I want to say the only things that are in there. It's the extremal clause. I want to be able to say only. That's the only way it can happen. That's what, 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 what happens. So I want it to be the strongest. And the reason is, is I'll just throw in a little, uh, a little aside for you, okay, about why I wanted demand to be the strongest. The reason is, is so that I have an induction principle. So, so this gives us an induction principle. It's not exactly mathematical induction like you learned in school, because if these are not exactly the natural numbers like you learned in school. They have these embedded computations, so you have to be careful. It's morally, but it's not literally mathematical induction. So it gives us uh, induction principle, okay? So that's why we call it the strongest. And now what I want to say is why do I demand the strongest? Like, why don't I just say m equals m in that if and only if it evaluates to zero or they evaluate the successors which are equal. Well, the reason is, is there's two different solutions to that problem, and I want the smallest one. And the thing is, why do I want to do that? So consider the following thing. Uh, I will write something called fix, okay? So I can write this program. It's the Y combinator. If you want, I can write it using Y. I can have the Y combinator, but let's write it as fix. So I'm going to do a fix of A dot successor of A. And the idea is that, as always with fix or recursion self-reference, that steps to the successor of fix of A dot successor of A. Okay, because it just unrolls the recursion, right? Here's a fix, that's not a value. It makes a transition by unrolling, so it becomes a successor, and now that's a value because, okay, I should have said this over to the side, so I should have said zero is a value. Uh, successor of M is unconditionally a value, Regardless, I, I don't care. So these I'm defining off to the side. Uh, that's it. And then I'm going to define something called the recursor, which I will get to in a moment. So I'll write m0 uh, a dot m1 of m, and I will define that in a moment. That, that, that will come up. Okay, so we have these values. And the point is, is that the successor is a value independently of whether m is. I don't care. Okay, M does not, that's why it's not a numeral because this isn't necessarily literally zero or successor, it's a computation will be. Okay, so, so I can make this transition. So this is, a, my point is that this is a value. So now we're done, that's a value. So I can write here, 
val that's a value. Okay, let's call this value omega, okay, because it's basically an infinite stack of success, okay? All right, so that's the, why do I say that? Because if I peel off a successor, then I'll be back to here, which will transition and emit another successor. And if I peel that off, it'll emit another successor, and it will do that forever. So this is uh, uh, a point at infinity. And so the idea is that, if you want to do this, is that if we look at, so the point is, is that omega inhabits the greatest solution to the to the specification uh, to the to the to the spec that let me erase that so let's call that omega to the specification which says that if m is in or they're equal in that then either m evaluates to zero and m prime evaluates to zero or uh, M evaluates the successor, and M prime evaluates the successor, oops, successor of N. M prime evaluates the successor of N prime, and N equals N prime in that. And in, in this, uh, I'll call it, well, I'm going to call it conat because that's what it's going to, that's a natural thing to say, okay? All right, so my point is, is if your requirement is, I want the biggest thing such that everything in it is either zero or successor of something else in there, the biggest thing will include omega. Because an infinite stack of successors, intuitively, that's not exactly technically what's going on here, but morally, it's kind of what's going on here. An infinite stack of successors satisfies the requirement. If you put it in there, it evaluates a successor, and the, what it's a successor of is exactly in there, because uh, it's the same thing that we, we started with again. So the least and the strongest, okay, are going to be different, okay? So the idea, so we would have omega is not going to be in that. Okay, and we can check that. So that's the reason why I got into the strongest and greatest, okay, why I was mentioning that last time. So I want it to be the strongest, and it gives us an induction principle. Okay, so it's the strongest, okay, so, so really what I want to say is strongest such that if m is evaluates to zero, m prime evaluates to zero, then they're in there, and if m prime evaluates to m, uh, to a successor, and so that m prime, and these are equal, then they are also in there. That's what I mean, the strongest one like that. So it's the only way you can get it, and so it gives us an induction principle. Okay, so now let's look at the recursor. So the idea is that this makes a transition to m0 a dot m1 to m prime if m prime makes a transition. So this is sort of a value argument. And then the idea is, now if you don't mind because it gets kind of tedious, let me call that guy capital R. Okay, so I will write R of zero transitions to M zero, and R of the successor of M transitions to what? Oh, I made a mistake here. Uh, these take two arguments, and I'll show you what it is. It's A and B dot M and A and B. That's a button. It binds two variables in that position, okay? And then the idea is it's M1. And what do I do is I plug in the predecessor and the result of the recursive call for A and B. Okay, so that's what I do here. So this is the predecessor because it's the thing you're taking successor of. And then this is the result of recursive call. Okay, that's the, that's, the, that's the idea. So this is how we execute these programs. And then I can state a very similar fact to the one I just did, okay? So what we do is let's uh, do it like this. So I have that with A and NAT, I have B as a type. That's the uh, first thing, so we'll just fix all of these things. We will say that M0 is in B with uh, zero for A. So that's our assumption. And then I will have a hypothetical here. So it says, whoops, with A in that, and B in, I'll just write B, but it has an A in it, you see. So I'm choosing the same A, so that has an A in it, okay? So I'm doing that. Assuming that, I get that M1 is in B of what successor of A, okay, for little a, good. So we fix all that. Okay, then we have the following thing that if M is in that, 
then, and then again, if you don't mind, I'll write R, R of M, okay, is in B with M. So this is just like what we wrote before. If M is in bool, then I of M, the, the if, is in B of M. Okay, it's exactly the same pattern. So the point is, is that it tracks. We know where we are, okay? All right, and so what is the proof, okay? Well, we have the strongest thing such that if they both evaluate to zero, it's in there, and if they both, uh, if they both evaluate uh, to a successor with the predecessors being in there, then they're also in there. So I can, I can, I can uh, do this uh, by induction, okay? So I can consider two cases, okay? One is in which M evaluates to zero, and, and then what happens when M is evaluates to zero? Well, then it's equal to zero in that by head expansion, and we know that M naught is in B with zero for A. And we know that since this is a family of types and we have that equation, that that type is equal to B of M for A, okay? And, uh, and we know that the recursor R, when applied to zero, excuse me, uh, when applied to zero, uh, it steps to and is therefore equal to M zero. And so we get that R zero, oh, and this, is R of M. So R of M is R of zero because M is zero, and R zero is equal to M zero because that's how it evaluates as I have over on the board there. M zero is in B zero, B zero is in BM. So in the end, what we're getting is that R of M, okay, is in B of M when M is equal to zero. Okay, so we get that. And then the other possibility is M evaluates the successor and then what do we know by induction? Okay, by induction what we know is that R of N is in B of N. Okay, we get, we get to know inductively. See, I showed here R of M is B of M when M is zero. Now I inductively get to know for the predecessor that this is the case. And then I will leave you to finish the proof and now finish the proof. Okay, it's a lot like what we were doing, uh, what we were doing with the conditional. So the idea will be, well, what does R do on successor of M? Well, it steps to plug in the predecessor and the recursive call for A and B, but A, M1 is functional in those two positions. So if I plug those guys in, I will get something in B of the successor, and then I do equational reasoning like I did for conditional. So you should finish the proof here. Okay, so I will just say a lot like, a lot like the conditional, okay, except that we have a proper recursive call. In other words, the transition says here, plug that guy's with R of M, and the inductive hypothesis will cover that. Okay, so, like, so that's an example of a thing you can prove. Okay, so are we reasonably okay with that? I realize that we can't, you can't prove every detail in your head right away, but this afternoon I'll pop around. If you guys want to work on that, we can talk in more detail. It gets a little, there's this balance. I do too many details of proofs at the board, you're all going to go to sleep. So, so it's better if I just say do it as an exercise. Okay, so we'll do that. Okay, good. So now, like, where things are starting to take shape, okay? So we have, we have, uh, uh, we start to have some thing, things on the board, okay? So, good. So now we, I've shown you how to do Booleans, how to do, how to do the, the natural numbers. Now, I won't be able to, and I've given a hint about, okay, so, so what, what these is, is these are representative examples of inductive types. I gave you a hint, which I won't expand upon, about representative examples of co-inductive types. So rather than taking the least things that contain some, that satisfy some conditions, I'll take the strongest thing that implies some conditions, the strongest things that are consistent with some conditions. One can do that, I'm not gonna develop that anymore here. I made a hint about omega just to give you a flavor, but I won't develop that any further. I will be talking about a generalization of inductive types called higher inductive types, which is why I'm, I'm kind of concentrating on these examples now. I want it to be the on-ramp for what we do in a little while. Okay, so good, so that's where we are. So the next thing I want to do is look at some very simple things. Products, and this is the, the simple case, and functions, and then I will generalize them to the dependent case. So first we'll do the simple case. So what I'm claiming is there exists a type system that has the following characteristics. 
That's what I'm going to do here, okay? That's the part I'm just going to say, say, okay? So the idea is I'm going to end up saying that we're going to have A1 cross A2 is equal to A1 prime cross A2 prime if A1 is A1 prime and A2 is A2 prime. Whoops. Okay, good. So that's the first thing. So in particular, A1 cross A2 is a type if A is a type and A1 is a type and A2 is a type, because that's the reflexive case. Okay, so we're 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 going to say we're going to say that. So I can even say this is true if and only if this is for the canonical things, and then the types evaluate to both sides. So I want to say that. Okay, now I want to say the following thing: is I want to say m is equal to m prime in A1 cross A2, if and only if the idea is. M evaluates to a pair M1, M2. M prime evaluates to a pair M1 prime, M2 prime. So, uh, you're right. And, and I know that M1 is equal to M1 prime in A1, and M2 is equal to M2 prime in A2. Okay. Now, the way I, I actually will... Well, would define this as in terms of defining what the values are. So these are two values of the type under those conditions. And then I say, uh, in general, equal values of that type are things that evaluate to values of the type, and these are the values. So that's kind of to get the definition a little bit more precise. But I'll just be a little bit like hand wavy here and say, look, there's a type system with this property. So this is the case. These are equal in here, if and only if. M and M prime evaluate as specified, and so on. Now I'm assuming that we have around here that that's a program. I'm assuming that cross, that's a program. I'm assuming, I, I need to write that all down, but I don't want to write everything on the board. I'm assuming that that's a program. And as I go along, when I start using certain things as programs, I will indicate what their operational semantics is, but I have in mind, this is a pre-existing thing. You just know how to run these things. And I do have to tell you, but um, for the sake of efficiency at the board, I will kind of wave my hands over some of those. So I'm assuming that these are values. OK, so that's what I'm doing here. And then it's just going to be a fact. We're going to get good facts like this under appropriate circumstances. So what are the appropriate circumstances? Well, we'll figure that out. But the idea is, if I take uh, what I will say is, uh, let me write it out. OK, so I want to, can, I, can you give me a moment here? So I want to say, uh, I need something here. I'll figure out what that is. If M is an A1 cross A2, all oh right, I, I know what it is. Okay, then first of M, or I call it for some reason in my book, all right, M.1 M is in A1 and M.2 is in A2. And again, this is a, uh, a fact, okay, not a definition, where we assume that A1 is a type and A2 is a type so that I know that A1 cross A2 is a type so that it makes sense to talk about a member of it. And if that's a member of it, this is a member and that's a member. Oh, yeah, so I, I, uh, if I can pause here for a moment, let's hit pause for a moment. The thing I wanted to say back here is you'll notice that membership or the equality of members in the product type is defined in terms of mem member equality in each of the component types. So the reason the whole construction in the end makes sense, that's the asserting part. Part of it is we're considering that these constituent types are already given, and then we speak about the compound type made from them. That's a staging that's, that is uh, necessary for the whole thing to make any sense. So I'll just mention that. And that's a characteristic feature of logical relations is you assume the interpretations of A1 and A2 are given, and then I tell you what the interpretation of A1 cross A2 is. So that's the, that's the idea. So if I have these pre-existing types, then I can speak about their product, then I can speak about their members in the following way. Okay, and here it's very easy, provided we understand what we mean by M1 and what we mean by M.1 M and M.2, because of course, I'm going, to have the, uh, I'm going to have an operational semantics that looks like this. So what we'll say is if M transitions to M prime, then M dot, let me write M dot I, if you don't mind, transitions to M dot 
m'i, in other words, they evaluate their arguments, and then the very evident thing, which is m1, m2, dot 1, or dot i, steps to m sub i. Okay, so this is i equals 1 and 2. That's what you would have thought, but I'm just saying these are the programs, then that's how they run, okay? And now I want to say, okay, so now what I want to do is I need to show that this is in here. So how do I do that? Let me wave my hands. So the meaning of this is m.1 evaluates to a value in here. That means if m.1 evaluates to a value, it evaluates m to a value. So this will have a value. That value must be a pair. If that value is a pair, if this evaluates to a pair, which it must, this assumption tells us, so we know, so we know that m evaluates to a pair. Therefore, m.1 steps to that pair, dot 1, and that, by definition, steps to m1, and we know that that is in a1 uh, already, because here we know that with, we know not only from the definition that it evaluates to a pair, but m1 is in a1, and, and moreover, m2 is in a2. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's essentially how the argument goes. Okay, goes like that. So you just analyze the evaluation behavior. It'll get more complicated in a minute when I do the dependent case, but this is, this is the, es the essence of it in the non-dependent case. So what I will point out is, let me point out, uh, can, can I think for just one moment here? Uh, yes, uh, okay, I will, I will put uh, the functions on a different board. So let me, let me start using this board. Okay, so now I can prove another fact which should strike you as a little bit odd. Okay, uh, if I do this right. So yes, yeah, so what I say is, if M1 is in A1, then, and I know that A1 and A2 are types. Let's, okay, I'll start asking you to deduce those kind of assumptions automatically, but I'll mention if A1 is A2 or type, and M1 is in A1, then, in fact, uh, the pair M1, A2, M1, M2, dot 1, will be exactly equal to M1 and A1. And in fact, so therefore, I don't even know, need to know that A2 is a type. Except for, no, I, I don't. I, I'm pretty sure that this should be true. The point that I'm making is there's no requirement on M2. Because the meaning of this, of, this, uh, of this assertion is this evaluates to the same thing that evaluates to. This steps to M1, and of course M1 evaluates to the same thing as it does, okay? And that's in A1, and I know that M1 is in A1. So this means M1 is equal to itself in A1. Therefore, I can go by head expansion. This thing, whoops, the other way around. This thing, head expansion is m.1, steps to that, so by head expansion, I get the equation I want. Okay, or excuse me, uh, pi, uh, the pair m1, m2, m1, m2.1, steps to m1, which is equal to m1, that's my assumption, and so I get this. Okay, so the point is there's no requirement here. So the, the facts you can prove are pretty general in this regard because since everything is about program behavior, and I can see straight here on the page that you're only referring to the first component of this pair, then of course I don't need to make any requirement about M2. Now that seems like a technical anomaly, but in fact it, it's of the essence to how all this works, and it'll be hard for me to justify that remark. I'll just I'll just remark it, okay, uh, is that it's of the essence that everything works by virtue of how it executes. That's very important. So it's a, basically an issue of treating types as specifications as opposed to a grammar for writing down well-formed things according to syntactic rules. And then they would have all sorts of requirements that are not strictly necessary just to know this fact. Okay, so. So there's, a, there's an idea that the idea, the, for, the purpose of a formal type theory is to impose protocol. So ordinarily, you know, diplomats are very good at uh, adhering to protocol. That's, that seems to be no longer true. But, the, but the, uh, the usual thing is that there are rules of behavior, and you write those rules down, and no matter how stilted it is, you obey them. So that's what uh, formalisms are all about. They're about protocol and obeying protocol. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, get to that. I'll get to that in a minute. So let me talk about functions. 
So I'm going to follow the same sort of pattern. It's going to look the same. So here it's uh, very easy. So these are going to be equal to, uh, these are going to be equal if and only if they're component-wise equal. Yeah, I'm going to want that. And then I'm going to say what it means to be functions. They both have to evaluate the lambdas. So let's call it lambda a dot, I'll call it m2, because I think that will be suggestive, a dot m2, uh, m2 prime. And then the important thing, I'll use the hypothetical judgment, m2 and m2 prime are equal as maps. So that's what I was telling you earlier in this lecture in B. Uh, sorry, A2, pardon me. I call them M2 for exactly that reason. Okay, A2, not B. And this should be A1, though. Sorry about that. Okay, so, uh, so that's what that, what that should be. So this, I claim, is a definition. There exists a type system that has these properties. Okay, so the idea is that if I have uh, some functional behavior in mind, equality of the functional behavior means uh, that they both evaluate to lambdas. They must be lambdas that are constructed of the same underlying mapping. Meaning they respect equality in this position. So as you would expect with any function, if m1 is equal to, if, you know, if m1 is equal to m1 prime, then, then f of m1 is equal to f of m1 prime. It respects equality. So that's built in here. I'm respecting the equality that I'm defining. Okay, so that's quite important. Moreover, it will work out that these are what are called extensional functions. So that, that I'll, I'll mention it in a moment. Okay, so now you can prove again as a fact. Okay, I'm going to assume I have a round application. So I'll write it out in a somewhat stilted form. So let me write, first of all, this is going to be a value. A lambda is a value. There's nothing more to do. And then we have a notion of application. So let's call it M applied to M1. And that will step to M prime applied to M1 if M steps, M steps to M prime. So if you're going to apply a function, you have to know what function you're applying. But you do not have to know what the value of this argument is, given that we're in a type theory where there's no divergence as possible. So that's like part of everything that's going on here, is we're in a total setup. If I were not in a total setup, I might have to worry about certain things. But here, we'll just do it the way Martin Luff originally suggested, and this works out pretty well. So we'll, 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 we'll consider it like that. And then we will say, if you apply lambda a dot m2, you know what I'm going to say, to an argument, then it's the good old beta reduction, and I plug that guy in. And that's how I, that's how I run these things. It's just beta reduction, but I'm, I'm giving a reduction strategy. I specify a particular you know, execution pattern. If you have an application, the thing you have to do is work on M. You don't get a choice. So it's not beta reduction in that, in the technical sense of the word beta reduction. It's a reduction strategy that is given by these, by these rules which I'm specifying for the optimal semantics. So, okay, so we, we do that. Okay, good. So that's that much. And now uh, what I can say is, under suitable assumptions, I basically want to say the following thing. If M is, in fact, a function, and M1 is, in fact, an argument, then their application will be in the codomain as we've written it here. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's important. Okay, I will leave that proof as an exercise. Okay, that's another exercise for you. Okay, you just have to look at the definition. That means it evaluates to a lambda, and then you work with head expansion because this will evaluate its argument, which will be a lambda, and then it'll do the beta reduction, and then uh, the definition of what M is uh, being in here will guarantee that you get where you want. I'll just wave my hands there, but we can do that out as an exercise. Okay, so we have to do that. Okay, good. So I wanted to get to that. Now, the thing I want to point out, I want to point out a few other things that I can do as an exercise. And here is, here is a rather important one. If I know that M and M prime are both functions from A1 to A2, uh, and I know that they have the same application behavior, in A2, then they're in fact equal.
And again, I will leave this proof as an exercise. It's not difficult. You just work out from the definitions I've given you. But what it's saying is any two functions that behave the same under application are the same. Okay, and for whatever reason, this is called function extensionality. And I would argue this means we really are dealing with functions here and not things that are kind of function-like in some respects. Okay, so my little snide remark will become, I'll explain that in a moment. Okay, so, all right, so that's the notion of, of function extensionality. It's a fact, okay? In other words, uh, yeah, it's not like, I, uh, by definition, it's, by, it's, a, it's a, just a consequence of the definitions I've made. Okay, so that, that's what's, what's important here. Okay, good. So, uh, so that's the that's kind of setup. Now these things will look familiar to you because a lot of times you will see this fact written out as an inference rule that looks like this. Now I'm going to use notation I haven't defined for you yet, but I'll write it out. You've seen this written before. It uses a turnstile and a dot and a colon, and I'm, I'm not quibbling about syntax. I want to make sure I distinguish meaning, and that's why I want the syntax to be, to be different. But the thing you've seen a million times in your life, I'm quite sure, is something that looks like that, written as an inference rule. I'll, I'll use the apply syntax, but M, M1, colon, A2. So what this theorem is, is saying the following rule is valid. That's what that fact is saying. This rule is valid. If I interpret this as meaning, hypothetically in gamma, so let's suppress the gamma because there's what is called a naturality condition going on here, that this is stated for all possible gamma and the various things commute with substitution. I'm gonna suppress that at the moment, but the fact that these are always written with gammas is expressing a uniformity or naturality that is necessary for the formalism. But the intuition is, if this is a program that evaluates, so inductively, if I'm showing it's valid, this will be a program that correctly, in the sense here, inhabits the function type, and this is a program that correctly evaluates the domain type as given by the definition I'm giving, then this will correctly inhabit that. That's what I'm saying right here. So this expresses the semantic content of that. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. So this is the, the syntax or the protocol, okay, or the syntax, or whatever you'd like to say. And I'm saying these inductively defined rules are going to define for you some sufficient conditions for truth. These, this is saying something is true. It's a fact, blah, blah, blah. This rule is saying, well, if you do this according to an inductive definition of this, these judgments written, these formal judgments, typing judgments written here, then inductively these are true, therefore this is true. That's what that is saying. Okay, now why do I bring this up? The reason I bring this up is uh, the following reason. I want you to observe. What is the quantifier complexity of the judgment m equals m prime in nat or nat. I had a reason for bringing up nat or nat. If you've run this before. What does it mean for m and m prime to be equal in nat or nat? Well, let me write it out in a very informal way. It means for every equal argument, so m1, there exists an answer, let's call it P1, and it's going to be equal to P1 prime in that, such that, there's going to be P1 such that, uh, well, you can write it with application. Application of M applied to M1 is equal to an application of M prime applied to uh, M1 prime, okay, in that. In other words, the, when I write this assertion down, and if you unravel my definition, the meaning of two things, two functions being equal to that or not, is for every equal argument, there exists equal results. That's what it means for them to be equal. If you give them equal arguments, and you apply them both, you'll get equal results. It's for all exists. That's just a matter or not. If you look at inductive definition, if I write inductive definition, and I write down rules, no matter what my syntax is, and this is where my brain cloud earlier got me in trouble. I have a syntax.
syntax with triple bar is very commonly the case. Oh, that's right, Matt or Nat. Okay, I don't care what your, what your conditions are. I don't care how many rules you have. It's recursively enumerable. Because the meaning of this judgment is there exists a derivation. You can crank up rules. So for this thing to hold means I can crank out the rules and form a derivation that ends with that. Yes? That's what that means. Okay? The meaning of the things given by rules is you just compose the rule. So for this to be valid means there exists a derivation tree that ends with that. Well, that means its corner bar complexity is exists something. For all exists cannot be captured by exists alone. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it looks like you quantified over the piece, but then the, the, the piece don't actually uh, appear. It looks like you quantified over the piece, but the piece... Well, it's for the results. So don't actually appear in the thing to the right. Because th such that this evaluates to P1, and this evaluates to P1 prime, and, and they're equal. Okay. So that's what I meant. Sorry, I was roughing it out. I'm, I'm rushing. I have to not fall in the trap of rushing. I'm sorry. Uh, but the point is, is that its quantifier complexity is for all exists, which is called pi, pi two in the arithmetic hierarchy. It's called a pi zero two sentence. Anything you write down by rules is relentlessly same as zero one. Exists a derivation, blah. I'm sorry, you're never capturing these these other equations. You cannot axiomatize equality in that or not. Not possible. Now suppose I make it nat or nat, arrow, nat or nat. That's for all exists, arrow for all exists. And then you rotate quantifiers, fool around with that. It's an even higher quantifier complexity. It only gets worse, okay? Life gets worse and worse and worse, okay? Because the complexity of whether two things are equal is determined by their type. So as the type gets more complicated, the statement of what it means for elements to be equal in them gets more and more complicated. But with inference rules, you're relentlessly sigma one. Okay? You're always stuck with just an enumeration of facts. Okay? So you can never get that correct. You can never capture it. This will lead to some problems, which I will get, begin to talk about next time. So I'll tell, you, I'll tell you more. But this is just like advanced remark that comes up already. Okay? So for me, it is therefore very difficult for me to take a collection of rules as being canonical in any way. You have a collection of rules that you use, you get work done, you like it. Great. I have nothing against you. That's perfectly fine as long as they're valid. Otherwise, I don't really want to believe your results. I want to know if they're, they're, they're true. But do what you like. I mean, whatever turns you on, good. Do whatever rules you want. But it's not the subject matter. That's my, from this perspective, that's not the subject matter. The subject matter is what I'm describing to you by this construction of type systems. And then you're just getting a pale approximation that is motivated by pragmatic considerations. That's like the way I look at things, okay? So just so you, like, I'll just mention that. Okay, the business about quantifier complexity, these are just facts. The other things are sort of my personal things and I'm trying to flag that and you can flush them right down the toilet. But these things are, are facts, okay? So that, that's true. Okay, so now to finish for today, good, uh, timing is not too bad. Okay, to finish for today, uh, what I would like to do <clears throat> is look at the dependent case. So let me think about my board discipline. I probably need bigger boards. So I can't, okay, I think I can, this will work. Okay, so what I will do the following thing. Okay, so I want to now look at what are called, they're often called dependent products. And then I will also look at dependent functions. And I've already foreshadowed what's going on here. 
So let's write dependent functions. Because I was trying in my lecture yesterday to give a kind of hand wavy overview of the what and the why. Uh, so I've, I've foreshadowed a few things. So let me look here. So what we're going to do is we're going to change from A1 cross A2 into this notation. A is in A1 cross A2. And the meaning of that is the following. I'm going to say, okay, what? I'm going to say that this is, these two things are equal if and only if what? A1 is equal to A1 prime outright. And then hypothetically or generally in A1, the A2s are equal. So the idea is that, and then the, the, the idea that will become apparent right now. So what I will say is M is equal to M prime in A, A1 cross, excuse me, cross A2. I want to say if and only if what? Again, it's going to be pairs, but the criterion of what it means to be a pair satisfying this sharper specification is slightly different. So this part is the same. They're both, they both evaluate to pairs. This part is the same. They're both, the first components are equal in A1, but now the, the issue is the second. The second components are equal in A2 in which you plug in A1. Uh, 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 pardon me, uh, yeah, M1, okay, for A, A2. Now, truly, I should be saying this under the presupposition that A1 is a type and A2 is a family of types under A and A1. I'm implying that. So again, as the kind of thing I've said before, that's the same type as this guy under the assumption that A2 really is a family. So I have to, I'm suppressing that presupposition, but it should be here. So the critical thing is this guy, okay, is that what it means to be equal is determined by the M1 instance, equivalently the M2 and M1 prime instance, the M1 instance of A2. So the idea is that this evaluates to a type, and which type it evaluates to determines what it means for them to be equal. So you have this family, family of types A2, so you have your A1 over here, and then for everything in A1, little a1, little a2, et cetera, all the way down, or let's call them M1, M2, M1, M2, et cetera, all the way down, for each one of those, I get an instance, A2 of M1, A2 of M2, et cetera, all the way down. I get this whole family of, of types. That's the idea. So it's like this family of types indexed by this type. And so the second components have to obey the spec that is given by instantiating the family at the first component. So it's dependent. There's a notion of dependency. So that's, uh, that's the first part of the definition, okay? And there's a similar thing goes on over here. I'm, uh, I'm conscious of my time. Uh, oh, sorry, A1 prime. Okay, we have that. And now the critical thing is this. What does it mean to be equal in these types? So what uh, we have M evaluates the lambda A M2. So this is the same M prime. They're both lambdas. The issue is simply, whoops, M2 prime. The issue is simply what, what the spec is. And the spec is that uniformly in the argument that M2 have to be M2 prime in the specialized range type in which I know Oops, which with, well, this has uh, an A in it, so we'll just write in A2, but I will remark that it has an A in it. It depends on the A. Because remember, what is the meaning of this? This means that if you give me equal arguments in A1, then I instantiate these guys, and they're going to be equal. And where is that going to take place? In A2 with M1 for A which is the same type under the right presupposition, it's the same type as this one, and we do that. Okay, so that's the meaning of that guy. Okay, good. Now, what I can give you as exercises are the following thing, and then we'll finish, so fact. So one, we can do it like this. I'll just give you, I'll just write out the, criti uh, the critical one. Okay, if M is in A1 cross A2, then, 
Well, first of m is in A1. In fact, I should also prove lots of things about equations, but this is, these are, these are going to be true facts, okay? They're not the only thing I can prove, but these are true facts. So this is the case. And, and now the important thing is second of m is in A2 with first of m. And in order to do this, this proof, you need to use the same kind of reasoning I showed you with the Booleans and I alluded to with the Nats. There's the same kind of thing goes on having to do with equality. And I'll, I'll let you discover this, okay? So figure this out. And then the other thing is, another fact is, if I have something whose type, whose fun as a function, whose type is characterized in a certain way, and for example, I give you a particular argument, then the application of m to that argument is going to be in the specialized type m1 for a. So the important thing is that guy. Those are the, those are the two points. So these, again, I will leave you as exercises. Okay, given the definitions that I've given you in the, in the example I've shown you at the board, I think these are doable, and of course I'm willing to help you. And I will also, uh, 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 we can have discussion on Slack, for example, or we can do it in person. So I'll, be, I'll help you, but, I, but of course I'm willing to help you, but I, I do believe you can, you can do these, okay? So, so this is, uh, uh, I think you should, you should try those. So now, at this point, so to finish up for today, I've developed the rudiments of a dependent type system. I've got Booleans. I've got the natural numbers. I have this A1 cross A2 dependent. This is, in the literature, is a lot of times written with a sigma, but I don't know. All right. And, and this would be written with a pi. But unlike the things that you'll see in the literature, I inherently, I would say it's inherently computational. Inherently computational in nature. In particular, oh yes, here's another little exercise for you, which has to do with a remark I made in my first lecture. Let me figure out where to do this. Uh, you should also prove for yourself the thing I said uh, in the beginning. If I do 17 else true on M, I want you to prove that this is the case. That bool on M. It's not hard, but prove this. So this is an exercise. The reason I'm suggesting it is you'll notice this is a program that computes a type. And this is a program that computes a, a term. And in terms of syntactic type, this is all like and get started. But it's a perfectly sensible thing because the meaning of this has to do with running this and running this and doing the, spelling out the definition. So you should check that that assertion I made in the beginning of yesterday's lecture is true, and you should check that. Okay, so we, so we have quite a bit here. So we have these, the structure already, and what we're going to do next time is we're going to talk about uh, what are called equality types and identity types. Equality and identity types. And I will also talk about the, what I prefer to call the propositions as types principle, which is a semantic principle. And I'm going to emphasize that, and I will contrast it with the so-called curry Howard, which is a bad name, because yes, curry and Howard had something to do with it, but so did Kolmogorov and Martin Luff and De Bruyne. So like, uh, it's terrible. That, that terminology is just terrible. Okay, so there's something called the formal correspondence, which is that thing, and the semantic correspondence, which I think is the important thing. And we'll explain, I'll explain that. Next time. Yep. The expression is not a bool. Did I write this correctly? I hope. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that expression with M unspecified. Oh, M would be a Boolean. M has to be a Boolean. Yeah. Oh, M is a Boolean, but we don't know the value of the moment. Yeah, I forgot. Uh, well, yeah, M is a Boolean because. Yeah. So my question is do you consider that expression a canonical one or not? No. No. Oh. Sorry, I had the thing in my mouth. No. No. Uh, and that's part of the point. I just wanted to emphasize that in this computational setting, it's quite freewheeling. Types are certain forms of programs. And in a, certain re in a certain sense, it's a great relief. I mean, God, all right? It gets really stuffy to comply with protocol all the time. It starts to scream. So, OK. So, but anyway, that's the, that's the point. OK. You had a question?
No. Okay. Other questions I'm running, I don't want to step on the next person's toes. So. Alrighty, thank, thank you very much for your attention. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>